Good evening. Uh, thank you very much to Dr. Meng uh, and to the Center for the Study of Contemporary Buddhism and to the uh, Tonglin Kwok Yuan Foundation uh, for the generous sponsorship of this evening uh, and uh, to uh, the Buddhist Temples of Canada uh, for uh, sponsoring uh, the, the events of this weekend. I feel very fortunate to be here. This is my first visit to the University of British Columbia. You have a beautiful, beautiful campus here. Uh, and it's a great honor to be included in the series and to share my thoughts with you. And, uh, and I, uh, some of you must be connected with the university community here. But because of, of the events of this weekend, also uh, many of the ministers of the Buddhist temples of Canada uh, are also in attendance here. And I'm very humbled uh, to have the opportunity to speak uh, to all of you. So as Dr. Main uh, uh, so kindly introduced me, uh, my topic today has to do with understanding Shin Buddhism, which is my tradition, our tradition, in the larger context of religious pluralism and interreligious dialogue. And my presentation is based on uh, a, a presentation that I prepared um, for a conference on comparative theology and interreligious dialogue that was held in Boston College a couple of years ago. So I will, I will yarn your, beyond what I, I had prepared for that conference, but uh, it is in that context that uh, I explore these thoughts with you. So um, one of the things that we encounter in, in, uh, in the study of uh, religion within a pluralistic and diverse context is what to do about differences between religion. On the one hand, as part of the assumptions that we have about uh, dialogue between different faiths is that we're not all the same. And that's what makes dialogue meaningful, that we can learn from one another. But at the same time, religions tend to be comprehensive. That's as they, religions provide a complete umbrella under which we understand everything from the beginning of life uh, to its conclusion and even beyond. So in that sense, one might say that religions also conflict because they have different approaches to how to understand the larger worldview of life and death and even beyond. So this is part of what got me to thinking about how to understand those differences in a fruitful way. Because while on the one hand, religion has contributed so much to human life and culture, when we look at human history, we can see that so many of the conflicts, the wars, and difficulties in human history have also been caused by or influenced by the role of religion, and it continues to do so today. So it's in that context that I want to explore this topic. And as a starting point, one of the things I began to think about is um, the way that one can understand different religions without giving up their differences. And one might compare this to the study of language. So, uh, well, I was born in Los Angeles, California. And, um, and when I was two years old, my parents, because of my father's study, uh, as a family, we went to Tokyo, Japan. And uh, we went back and forth several times so that I've spent a total of 14 years in Japan and the rest of my life in the United States. <clears throat> and because of that experience, I had the experience of learning a foreign language very thoroughly, which is, in my case is Japanese. Once you learn one foreign language, it makes it easier to learn a second foreign language. So I've studied a little bit of Chinese, Mandarin. I've studied a little bit of French, a little bit of German. Most of these things I've forgotten because mostly I need to use my Japanese. <clears throat> but <clears throat> but that, what that tells us is that it's really important to have one's home language. In that sense, in order to understand not just the differences, but the significance of the differences between many languages and perhaps many religions, it's important to thoroughly understand one's own religion and then be able to reach out and learn about other religions as well. So I begin by talking about the main features of what we have come to call Shin Buddhism in North America, in Japanese, Jodo Shinshu, because some of you are probably new, relatively new to Shin Buddhism. So Shin Buddhism is a school of Pure Land Buddhism that originates with the work of the Buddhist priest and thinker Gutoku Shinran, who lived from 1173 to 1262. 
It's one of the largest developments of East Asian Buddhism. As a school within Mahayana Buddhism, it subscribes to what is known as the twofold truth, the twofold truth of form and emptiness, alternatively, conventional truth and ultimate truth or highest truth. And in this view, form is understood to, to refer to the world of appearances, to the world of various things and colors and tastes and shapes that we define with language. Uh, the truth of emptiness, or the highest truth, is realized when one sees into and through the illusory nature of the distinctions that we make with language. So for example, a few years ago, or several years ago, Pluto was demoted from planetary status to mere interplanetary fragment. But recently, scientists have had a change of heart. They say, well, no, it's not just a fragment. It's something in between. But does Pluto care whether Pluto is a planet or not? I don't think so. <laughs> so in this way, we can see that, well, it can be very useful. In, in fact, for human beings, essential to use language to label and to understand the world of differences through language and ideas and concepts. The universe itself doesn't inherently have concepts and differences, at least according to this view. And when we are able, according to Buddhism, when we are able to let go of the pigeonholing function of our mind, then we realize after having emptied out, that's why we call it emptiness, having emptied out these concepts and ideas, then we have a seamless whole or a kind of realization of oneness, of oneness. So in order to explain this, there's, I'm going to use an example from Zen Buddhism. There's a famous Zen saying that in, before enlightenment, a mountain is not a mountain. During enlightenment, uh, before enlightenment, a mountain is a mountain. So, you know, I look out, uh, in, in, uh, I live in Eugene, Oregon, so, so looking out towards the east, I see what, what are known as the three sisters. And I see the mountains, I say, those are the sisters. During enlightenment, however, I let go. I let go of the idea of mountain. And in that moment, I become one with the mountain. I become one with the mountain. And in that moment, there are no mountains. And yet, I'm most intimate with the mountain. So in that moment, the Zen Buddhists say, a mountain is not a mountain. But you know, just gazing at the mountains, I can't be in that state forever. My wife, I can hear in the faint distance, my wife calling out, time to go home before it gets dark. <laughs> in that moment, I come out of my trance-like state, being one with the mountain, and again, the mountain is a mountain. So I said, oh yes, it's such a wonderful time, just gazing out, at the three sisters, but now it's time to go home. And yet my relationship to the mountain is not the same as before. Because having become one with the mountain, now there's a feeling of closeness and a different experience. And, and so uh, I return to the world of form, but I have not left behind the realization of emptiness. I have not entirely left behind the experience of oneness. And I think we find this kind of experience very often in life. We meet someone for the first time. We exchange greetings, names. Hi, I'm Mark. Somebody says, I'm Joe, or I'm Sarah. And at that point, they're just an idea. But I get to know them. This is a work relationship, a friendship, whatever. But as we become closer and closer, then they're no longer just a label. They're somebody who feels, who thinks, uh, who has very distinctive characteristics, physical, emotional, uh, mental, and so then I get to know them more intimately. Then, when I call that person by their name, Joe or Sarah, has a completely different meaning for me because now I've experienced them at a level that one might compare to emptiness or oneness. Now, if I'm not able to let go of my initial impressions. So I meet someone, and immediately I have a negative reaction. I think, gee, that person is rude, or gee, 
Uh, that person seems to be arrogant. And I'm not able to get to know them more intimately because all human beings have many sides. Then I get stuck. I get stuck, and it can cause friction. For example, in the workplace, I have my idea about who that person is, and then I start to become curt or impatient, and that person then perceives me also in a negative light. And in Shin Buddhism, we say problems arise not because of form, not because of language, but because we get attached to the labels and preconceptions by which we label other people, other creatures, various situations. And in Shin Buddhism, we call this blind passion, blind passion. There's nothing wrong with passion or desire, but it's only when my mind becomes attached to the labels, the world of appearances, and then I'm blinded from seeing all sides of a person. I'm blinded by seeing reality as a whole that problems arise, I start to suffer, and I might cause suffering for other people. So without the illumination of oneness, one remains in prison alone in the darkness of blind passion. And this person who has blind passions in Shin Buddhism we call a foolish being. Foolish because of my attachments, my blind passions. However, the moment that I recognize my blind blindness, then I also start to become freed of my blindness. And then I can think, wow, that person can be very nice. Why did I think that person was always unkind, always rude? That was just my preconception. The recognition of blindness is made possible by illumination. Therefore, blindness and insight coincide in the moment of awakening. In Zen Buddhism, one of the main practices for cultivating this awareness of the emptiness or oneness is seated meditation. In Shin Buddhism, or in Jodo Shinshu, uh, our main practice is what is called the saying of the name, uh, the name of the cosmic Buddha, Amida Buddha. Uh, and this chanting of the name, we say, is Namo Amida Butsu, which is derived from the Sanskrit, uh, Namo Amitabha Buddha, where Namo is very similar to the South Asian expression Namaste, Namaste, very common in Nepal, Tibet, and India, literally means I bow to you. And Namo has the same root. So the Namo of Namo Amidabutsu literally means I bow to you. And when we bow, we have to let go of our preconceptions because we have to trust the other person that can hit me on the head. <laughs> so it's an act of giving myself to the other person. It's an act of entrusting. And when I give myself to the universe, then, in that moment, we say there's a realization of namo amidabutsu. I, this foolish be being, giving myself or entrust myself to the deep, deep reality of emptiness or oneness, which in Shin Buddhism we call Amida Buddha. Buddha means awakened one, and Amida means infinite light. But Buddha is not a static being somewhere out there, Buddha is an expression for the awakening that comes to us from deep, deep within the oneness of reality. And so I think it's more accurate to render this term, Amida Buddha, as the awakening of infinite light, the illumination of this oneness. Now, this emptiness or oneness itself is neither light nor dark, neither good nor bad. It's just the oneness beyond words, colorless, orderless, and formless. And in Shin Buddhism, we call this the formless dharmakaya, that is to say, the body of truth, in its aspect beyond form, that is, the aspect of oneness. But the experience of being freed from the suffering of my attachments comes to me as a kind of illumination. So, you know, if something is on my mind and I'm really, really worried, then I tend to give up kind of a tunnel vision. I bump into things more easily. Uh, I'm not seeing the field of vision so clearly. But maybe I take a walk in the woods or maybe I have a talk with a friend and I realize, gee, I was carrying so much unnecessary worry with me. 
And when that burden is lifted, it's not just that my mind is clear in an intellectual way, but my whole being becomes lighter. How many people have had that experience where something that clouds your mind and weighs you down and makes you even kind of physically feel heavier, taking a walk or talking to a good friend, suddenly you realize you had become stuck in a cul-de-sac, in a small world of worry, but now the burden is lifted, you feel much lighter. People who have had this kind of experience, yes, I think many of us have had that kind of experience. So it comes to us, so even though this oneness itself is colorless, is orderless, is shapeless, the realization of the oneness out of my confusion, out of my blindness, is experienced as a kind of a palpable illumination. True and trusting. The act of true entrusting to the name is called Shinjing, or true entrusting. And while the Shin Buddhist practitioner ever remains a foolish being filled with blind passions in this world, such a person is simultaneously awakened to just how deep my attachments are, and at the same time, how deep the oneness that dissolves that confusion and blindness. And when one looks closely, one sees that the saying or the chanting of the name does not occur from the side of the ego that tries to control reality with words and language, but comes from the depths of one's being, which flows, uh, which flows freely in the flow of the oneness of reality, like Pluto moving in outer space without any worry about whether it is a planet or not. Thus, Shinran, the, te- our, the founder and, and greatest teacher of our tradition states, true and trusting is none other than the expression of one's own true nature, or Buddha nature, that is our own awakened nature. And just as the Zen Buddhist meditator realizes that to truly engage in seated meditation is to completely give oneself over to one's own Buddha nature, in Shin Buddhism, one gives oneself completely over to this oneness, Amida Buddha, which is not a being out there, but is none other than our deepest, truest reality. So there are several ways to kind of explain the process, the unfolding process of realizing I'm stuck in my attachments, I'm stuck in my blindness, and to be brought out of it. And I'm going to use another source, uh, the Taoism of the ancient Chinese master Zhuangzi to help us illuminate this. The first is what I like to call perspectival awareness. Initially, I think my way or the highway. I know what the truth is, the other person is wrong. But over time, I learned that there are other perspectives. As Zhuangzi suggests, no one person, in fact, no single creature can define the standard of truth or goodness. So in the context of interreligious dialogue, one of the important truths of Shin Buddhism is to realize that at least in its outward expression, Shin Buddhism doesn't have the answer to every human problem. That other religions may also have unique contributions and we can all work together. Zhuangzi states, you know, if a man sleeps in a damp place, his back aches and he ends up half paralyzed. But is this true of a loach, a creature that likes to sleep in damp places? No. If a person sleeps in a tree, he's terrified and shakes with fright. But is this true of a monkey? Of course not. Then of these three creatures, which knows the proper place to live? You know, in ancient times, men claimed that Mao Chang and Lady Li were beautiful. But if fish saw them, they would dive to the bottom of the pond. If birds saw them, they would fly away. And if deer saw them, they would break into a run. Then of these four creatures, Who knows what the standard of beauty is? You know, when I go to Safeway, or I don't know what the name of your grocery stores here are, but when you go to the supermarket and you go to the cashier stand, well, you know, maybe it's different in Canada, but they have a magazine rack. And mostly, I guess, it's ladies who buy those magazines because there's a lady on the cover of every magazine. Sometimes it's the same lady. They all pretty much look the same to me. You know, all pretty much the same figure, right? But look at a painting, a Botticelli painting, 
from the 15th or 16th century, they are not the so-called hourglass figure, which apparently is prized today. No, in Botticelli's painting, it is the pear-shaped figure that is prized, yes? So, even for human beings, what is considered beautiful is different based on the time, the historical time period, based on the country or culture. <clears throat> and Zhuang Zi says, yes, that's, that's true for different human beings in different places and times, but not just human beings, different creatures. So different religions suit different people because people have different needs everywhere. One who clings to dogmatic views and fails to recognize the relative nature of one's own religious perspective becomes entrapped by one's own knowledge. As the Vietnamese master Thich Nhat Hanh states, in Buddhism, dogmatic knowledge is regarded as an obstacle to true understanding. Like a block of ice that obstructs water from flowing, it's said that if we take one thing to be the truth and cling to it, even if truth comes in person and knocks at our door, we won't open it for things to reveal themselves to us as they are and also for us to become aware of our own true humanity, we need to be ready to abandon our preconceptions. In Shin Buddhism, if one clings to the idea that one is a, for example, good Buddhist, if one, goes to, if one is a member of a Buddhist temple, one wants to be a good member, a good Buddhist, but if one is stuck on an idea of what that might mean, then that knowledge might actually prevent one from seeing beyond the artificially defined boundary between good and bad Buddhist, or even Buddhist and non-Buddhist. For that reason, Shinran states, even a good person attains the realization of oneness, but how much more so the evil person? Now this is interesting because he says, even a good person attains the realization of oneness, how much more so the evil person? And this is because the person of self-power, relying on their own ego-centered notions of what is good or evil, and therefore being conscious of himself being good, lacks the thought of opening his heart and entrusting himself completely to other power. That is to say, the power of oneness that, that is other than ego. And he is not, therefore, the focus of what is called the primal vow, which is the movement or the unfolding of the power of this oneness. So I think the implications for interreligious dialogue and comparative theology are fairly clear. On the one hand, if one is to truly realize emptiness or oneness, or the illumination of what Shimron calls the ocean of light, then all of one's foolish attachments must be illuminated and dissolved into this oneness, this infinite light, including even, or maybe especially, one's attachments to religion, even to Shin Buddhism, at least as something that appears in the world of concepts with shape and form. On the other hand, only with this awakening can one begin to see, hear, and appreciate the perspective of those who embrace other religious paths and perspectives. And so that's what I want to talk about next. And instead of merely talking about this in terms of theory, I want to introduce a few examples from my own experiences, in particular, my experiences working with students over the years. My primary teaching responsibilities consist in offering survey, intermediate, and seminar courses in Asian religions, and especially Japanese Buddhism. And of course, that includes Shin Buddhism. Uh, and I also offer other courses, including courses on comparative religion one in particular called Dark Self, East and West, in which we explore different views of the self as found in different religions and philosophies. Uh, and as part of the curriculum of a religious studies department at public university, even though we, we deeply delve into these matters, it's very important for me to keep church and state separate so that the teaching of religious studies is about religion, not teaching religion itself. I don't teach from a perspective of faith. In the university, we explore concepts and ideas, practices and philosophies, but I don't insist 
that any one particular religion or any one particular faith is the right one. Nevertheless, there are, I think, legitimate and significant ways in which we provide tools for students to explore questions about personal faith and religious meaning. In fact, I would argue there can be certain advantages to doing this in this indirect way. First, this indirect way allows students leeway to reflect inwardly on their own personal questions without being forced to be graded for them. So my job as a professor is to give them the tools to read, to discuss, to write. And their job as students is to develop those skills. And as long as they do that and I do my job, then I can't ask them about what their personal faith is. And yet, that gives them room to explore those topics on their own and even in writing their papers. Also, courses on comparative religions allow me to delve even more deeply often into religions than if I'm just teaching about one, about Buddhism, about Taoism or Confucianism, because we're comparing different religions in an equal way, then we try on each one as we go. And I can ask the students to try on each view in a more intense way than if I were just teaching one, because students know that I'm not favoring one religion over another. So the first example uh, involves uh, an example of indirect communication and what I call the existential self. So this was an early version of this course that I taught many years ago. And um, it was a large lecture course. And we were covering a segment on Japanese Buddhism. And, uh, and one of my students named Jake came in. And uh, he had a bit of an unhappy expression on his face. And I asked Jake, what can I do for you? And he said, I want to be Japanese. <laughs> and I can assure you, he wasn't Japanese. I said, Jake, I can't, I can't help you with that one. <laughs> this brief exchange, however, would become significant later on. A few weeks later, he came back again during office hours, and he asked for consultation. He said that he was thinking of quitting school to pursue his dream of becoming a musician. And you know, the University of Oregon has a fine music school, so that's one thing. But you have no formal training in music, and a, young, and a very young person comes to you and says, I want to I be a musician. Red flag goes up. His parents were supporting him through school, and they threatened to cut off his funds if he dropped out. But he felt that they should support his musical efforts, even if he dropped out of school. He wanted me to affirm his brilliant career move, including looking at some of his songs and evaluating their value. So he took out a crumpled piece of paper out of his pocket, where he had some lyrics written, and he asked me to look at them. <laughs> so I know very little about music. One glance at these jottings made it very clear that he was no musical project, prodigy. Well, I can't say I don't think that you have what it takes to be a musician, because he's coming to me precisely because I'm not his parent. So I, I'm going to close the door to any possibility for meaningful encounter if I say no. Right. So I just said something jovial but neutral, as well as suggesting that perhaps his parents were somewhat within their rights to deny him support should he embark on his musical endeavors. As the weeks went by, however, I kept this conversation in mind in light of his naive and romantic view of what he thought was Japanese and Japanese Buddhism, as well as his musical career. And then we came to one of the readings, which was not on Buddhism, but which was by a Christian thinker named Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard was a Danish theologian. And I felt I had an opening to say something that might be meaningful. I didn't change what I had planned for my regular lecture, but I subtly emphasized certain key points. So we were reading uh, excerpts from one of Kierkegaard's works called Sickness Unto Death, in which he talks about the self. The self as a synthesis. Kierkegaard says the self is a synthesis between the finite and the infinite, between necessity and freedom. So in order to illustrate what Kierkegaard meant 
by the self as synthesis, I gave a few analogies, including the following. When Kierkegaard says that the self is a synthesis of finite and infinite necessity and freedom, it's like saying that one needs to be grounded in reality, but also leave room for the imagination. One should have big dreams. And I didn't say this, but it could be dreams of being a musician. But one also has to live in the finite world, the world of necessity, which is to be financially responsible, which is to be realistic, and so on. So, you know, for us, I think it's probably true for many of us. We do not feel we are truly, fully human unless we let our imagination soar, unless we allow ourselves to have big dreams. But at the same time, we have to live in this world, which requires bill paying, which requires going to work, which requires meeting deadlines, and so on. As instructors, we often do not learn of the effects of our teaching on our students until much later, sometimes years afterwards. In fact, we may, in many instances, never receive feedback, even when students have had an impactful experience. But in Jake's case, I did get feedback. A few weeks later, as he came to see me again during office hours, it was totally unexpected given my previous experiences with him. He said, Professor Uno, I've been doing some thinking, especially after listening to some of your lectures recently. I think maybe I need to rethink some of my goals. Maybe I can think about my music in the future, but I've decided to focus on my studies in school for now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to finish my major in chemistry, but I need to ask you something. I'm applying for some PhD programs in chemical research and green technology, and I'm wondering if you can write a recommendation letter for me. So I had a temporary reprieve, but now I was caught in another difficult spot because he was not a brilliant student in my class. <laughs> he was a B minus student who was now reaching for a B or B plus. So writing recommendation letters is a very important part of being a college professor. It's kind of like playing Twister because you want to present the student in a positive light but at the same time, you can't tell a lie. So what I try to do when I write a recommendation letter is to highlight the strengths and the potential of the student so that if the student is accepted into the PhD program or what it is, then the advisor or professor will know where to look for the student's strengths and draw them out. This was an especially arduous exercise in recommendation letter twister. To make a long story short, not only was Jake accepted into a first-rate doctoral program, but I received a nice message from his advisor that he was the star of his class. So all of this was done indirectly. Through the lecture, I never mentioned his name. And also, it was based on Kierkegaard's view of the existential self, the self that exists in the tension between finite and infinite necessity and freedom. And for Kierkegaard, it's very important that one be very conscious of the self and the decisions that the self makes from moment to moment. It is a very tense, heightened awareness of self, which is very, very different, at least from one perspective, from the Shin Buddhist view, which seeks to dissolve the self in the flow of oneness. But in this case, even though I had lectured on Japanese Buddhism, and Jake even said he wanted to be Japanese, I didn't feel that that was going to be the most helpful venue to help him. In this class, in this particular case, at this time in his life, it turned out to be more helpful to draw on a Christian existentialist view of the self to help Jake. One more example. Ashley, authenticity, and theological complementarity. So one day, when one of my teaching assistants, uh, uh, Ashley, came in to talk with me, she had an ashen look on her face. What's the matter, Ashley, I said. Mark, I'm not sure what to do. One of the students in my discussion section just came to talk to me, and she confided that she has been going to Seattle on the weekends, where she has become involved with some 
very problematic activities. Immediately I stopped her. I said, Ashley, before you go any further, I need you to stop because I cannot be privy to the student's confidential information. You may not know this, Ashley, but when a student takes you into confidence, you can't tell other people, even the student's parents, because of strict rules about confidentiality. So I explained to Ashley that um, there were people and offices within the college that she could refer the student to, but once she allowed the student to confide in her, there were some things that she could perhaps convey to the student as advice. I was quite concerned from that point onwards as Ashley was quite clearly shaken and we were still in the middle of the course. Toward the end of the course though, she began to look much better and she came to my office to tell me what happened. Mark, the situation has been cleared up and I feel so much better. The student came in to talk to me and she has completely extricated herself from the situation that she got caught up in and the people she was involved with. She's no longer taking off for Seattle on the weekends and she's much more focused on her schoolwork. She told me that each week we read about a new thinker, a new religion, a new philosophy. She wanted to see how what she was doing on the weekends might or might not fit in to what we had been reading about. Regardless of the philosophy or religion though, she couldn't find a model of the self in which she could continue to do what she was doing and call it authentic. So even though each text, each religion, each philosophy offered a different perspective of the self and its dark side, there was no view of the self that presented to her by which she could continue her Seattle activities and, continue and, and see her present self as authentic. And for that reason, she stopped. So I said, Ashley, I'm so glad everything worked out. They don't always work out, of course, but in this case it did. And as her teacher, you played a crucial role. I myself was also quite relieved and pleased for Ashley and her student. Now, had someone sermonized the student directly or presented a particular religion as the answer, the student might not have engaged in the rigorous, deep reflection of her options and her life. But all the different religions and philosophies and the freedom to explore all of them and yet her inability to find what she was doing confirmed in any of them helped her to come to her own conclusion. So although I did point out points of similarity and resonance between the different religions and philosophies, uh, it was the student herself who embarked on her own search for selfhood and found authenticity as the thread that ran through all the sources she studied. In fact, you know, if I had made an explicit claim about the common ground and the common goal of all religions and philosophies, she might not have accepted it. It's only because she was able to explore on her own and come to her own conclusions that she was able to extricate herself from her situation. So here we see that the emphasis on theological and philosophical variety and differences can constitute a circle of complementarity by which students organically discover their mutual intimacy on the theme of authenticity. One might argue that this is similar to the way that interreligious dialogue might work, not just in the formal setting of a scholarly exchange, but among all people coming from diverse religious backgrounds. Individuals, once they're comfortable with one another, might begin to exchange their views about religion and when things go well, they might find common threads organically based on themes of mutual interest and informed by personal experience. One last example, one last example. So I was teaching the same course, not as a, not as a lecture course, but as an intermediate level course with about 50 students. And even though 50 students is quite a lot for discussion, we often had open discussion. And at the beginning of the class, I go around and have all the students introduce themselves. Now, this particular year, there was a very unusual older student. He looked to be probably in his 70s, uh, whom I had had before in an earlier survey course. He was a taller gentleman with a gentle gap-toothed smile. And he had an unusual appearance 
as he always wore a black robe with a hand-stitched insignia, and he had a matching pointed hat. <laughs> this is very typically Eugene, offbeat. When it came his turn to introduce himself, he handed a paper to the student sitting next to him and had the student read it. And the student read, um, you can call me monk. I have decided to take a vow of silence for three years, so I will not be speaking for the duration of the course. I would, however, like to audit this class and just listen if that's all right. That would be fine, Mr. Monk, I said. And as the weeks went by, the monk was always there, attentively listening to the goings-on. And after a while, you know, I began to notice <laughs> his presence more and more, even though he remained utterly silent. It was the quality of his attention. He smiled at every bad joke that I made. He was attuned to every insight offered by the students. He pondered every complex question. On the last day of class, we all sat in a circle again, and I had the students go around, this time to share their impressions of the class. The monk was there, and when it came his turn, he seemed to be holding something in his hand. And I thought it was a piece of paper he had scribbled something on that he was going to hand to the student sitting next to him. But then he got up out of his seat, and he started to approach me. And as, I, as he came closer, I realized that it was not a piece of paper that he was holding. It was a flower. It was a single white camellia blossom. He slowly came up to my desk chair, put the blossom on my desk. He took one step back, and through his gap to smile, he bowed. Spontaneously, I was moved and put my palms together, and I bowed in return. I was at a loss for words. Religiously speaking, he was not just from another world. He appeared to be from another planet. <laughs> and to this day, I have no idea which planet. He was from another era, a completely different cultural background. Yet in that moment, when he laid that flower on my desk and he bowed, I felt that the tips of his fingers pierced my heart through and through, and there was nothing left to do but return his bow. According to Shinran, the founder of Shin Buddhism, the path of Pure Land Buddhism of saying the name Namo Amida Butsu only applies to one person, himself. When I ponder the compassionate vow of Amida, that is, the embrace of emptiness and oneness, I realize it was for myself, Shinran, alone. And in this way, the Shin Buddhist generally does not feel that the path applies to anyone but him or herself. In fact, the Shin path of the foolish being and the awakening of infinite light opens the way for the follower of the name to let go of all constructs and to seek the point of encounter with what was until then defined as different, as other. But as the Taoist master Zhuangzi states, if one delves deeply enough into that point of mutual contact between self and other, between other people and oneself, other creatures and oneself, then one begins to realize that what were previously seen as polar opposites can, in fact, interpenetrate each other and may ultimately be one beyond words. He states, there's nothing bigger than the tip of a strand of hair in autumn. The great mythic Mount Tai is actually tiny. No one has lived longer than a stillborn child, and the great mythic Pung bird actually died young, and heaven and earth were born at the same time I was. It's significant here that the passage ends with Zhuangzi so stating, Heaven and earth were born at the same time I was, and the myriad creatures are one with me. The myriad creatures are one with me. These last two words, with me, indicate that for the author of the Zhuangzi, 
the oneness, is not a metaphysical speculation, but only takes on meaning as a lived realization. And it echoes Shinran's sentiment when he states, I realize it was for myself, Shinran, alone. We often hear about the celebration of religious diversity, the need for dialogue, and the significance of undertaking the comparative study of religion. But it's often difficult to carry them out in practice. Nevertheless, each time I encounter someone of a different background, precisely because of what I have been taught about foolish being, blind attachments, oneness, in the illumination of infinite light, I feel that I am being led into the secret treasure trove of someone's heart, of the divine spark, the mysterious Tao of existential meaning, the ocean of light. So I conclude by saying this is yet another beginning, another opening into that unknown world where religious difference is precisely the window to renewed self-understanding a world of complementarity through which I am led to discover more of the world and just as importantly, more of myself. Thank you very much.